This message is brought to you by DoNotAge.org, the longevity research organisation that's on a mission to extend health span for as many people as possible via products that actually work. Start your journey today at DoNotAge.org and use code LAMA for a 10% discount. That's L-L-A-M-A. When I go to uh, run after about five to uh, six, seven miles, I s- enter the stage of euphoria. When the beads of sweat rush down my face, I know that I have just entered that phase. Hello and welcome to the 100th episode of the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. I'm Peter Bowes. This is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Well, to mark this special occasion, special occasion for us reaching the grand old age of 100, I'm delighted to be with a man who earlier this year ran his 100th marathon at the age of 70. Dr. Zab Mozenifar is a pulmonologist here at the Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And by his own estimation, during a lifetime of running, he has been around the earth almost six times and can't remember a day when he was ever sick as an adult. Whether the two are related, we'll probably never know. But I think one thing is for sure, this is a man who personifies the concept of living a long health span, living life to the full in his eighth decade. Dr. Zab Mozenifar, welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Thank you, Peter. It's good to see you. Congratulations. 100 marathons, quite an achievement. Thank you very much. Well, running is my life, Peter. I know running is your life, and I'm fascinated by it. You run every day, don't you? I run every day. I get up uh, 5 in the morning, uh, 4.30, and uh, uh, Monday through Thursday, I run 5 to 6 miles, Fridays, 8, 9, Saturday and Sunday, 12 to 14. So adds up to be uh, 50 miles. And I was correct. 70, day in, day out. 70 years old? I am 70 and a half, actually. 70 and a half. The half is important. Why is running so important to you? be honest with you, running, I've been running really not uh, um, for uh, physical benefits. I run to maintain my sanity, uh, uh, not only... Uh, it's got physical benefits, but also has a lot of uh, mental uh, benefits. Uh, I can solve any problem, any complicated issue in my life during my runs. And uh, I take some of my problems to my running. So if I have challenging issues, I sort of put it in the parking lot. I say, tomorrow when I run, I'll think about it. And invariably, I come up with a solution. We'll talk much more about running in a second. Uh, we're at Cedar sinai Medical Center. You're a pulmonologist, which means that you specialize in the respiratory system. Sure. Uh, so I am a, uh, an exercise physiologist, actually, by my interest. Uh, I run the exercise physiology lab uh, and pulmonary function lab at Cedar sinai uh, I have been at Cedar sinai for 40 years. I just finished my 40th year at Cedars. Uh, Actually, my only job, uh, I was trained at UCLA. I came here 40 years ago, and uh, I've been here ever since. And we're sitting in your office at 8 a.m., actually just before 8 o'clock in the morning. You've already had one meeting today. You've already been running. Sure. I got up this morning already. I ran. I read uh, four or five newspapers, and uh, I met my fellow already this morning. I finished reading all the lung functions and uh, studies that were done yesterday, and they're all posted so physicians, they can see the results of the studies that they ordered. And uh, I have a long day ahead of me. And how was your run this morning? It was lovely. Today wasn't a very long run, actually. I I only ran about six miles this morning. and uh, Only run six miles this morning. Be honest with you, six miles doesn't do much for me. It takes me about six, seven miles just to stretch. (laughs) And uh, these are the runs that I do. They're on the trails, uh, Santa Monica Mountain Trails. I rise to about 1,500, 1,600 feet every day. I see the sunrise uh, every morning. Uh, from top of the uh, mountains, uh, I see the city of L.A., incredible uh, shining city, uh, and that just gives me so much pleasure, so much energy, so much just being that when I come to work, I am sort of, I feel that I am, uh, 
I have done um, a lot of drugs, which <laughs> may have been actually. Well, a lot of people say running and the, the endorphin release is, in a sense, a, a drug effect. There is a scientific merit to that as well, that there is evidence now uh, exercise uh, produces a certain amount of endorphins, uh, which are really opioid-type uh, substances. Uh, so you don't have to uh, rely on the drug companies to get OxyContin. This is, running is my OxyContin. And it sounds like you put yourself into really quite a zen-like state through running. And that's the relaxation. That's the, the mind in terms of mind-body. But that's the mind aspect of this, that it calms you. Sure. I am, uh, I am a very zen-type person to begin with. And when I go to uh, run after about five to uh, six, seven miles, I s- enter the stage of really euphoria. Um, and my uh, indication is that when the beads of sweat rush down my face, I know that I have just entered that phase. So you are a, a Zen-like person, but clearly there's a, a huge physical impact on your body as well. Sure. I mean, I, I, I live a healthy life. I, uh, <clears throat> I don't eat red meat. I have never had red meat. My parents were f- very poor and they could not afford uh, to buy uh, uh, meat and dairy both. So my mother always uh, bought dairy. And uh, um, I stopped eating chicken about 37, 38 years ago after a salmonella outbreak in the uh, state of Oregon that uh, this cultish people, they had uh, infected um, chickens and a salad bar. And, and uh, so I stopped eating chicken. When I go out, I eat fish uh, at home. I make my own pasta. Uh, I eat, um, actually, uh, it sounds crazy, but I eat pasta with pesto sauce every night. One of my favorite foods, actually. That's what I do every night. And uh, the monotony of it doesn't bother you as it does some people? I get a special pleasure from monotony. I I (laughs) have lived in the same house for 38 years. I've been married to the same woman for over 30 years. I have had the same job. I had the same car for um, 30 years which recently actually failed the smog test terribly, so I had to uh, sell my car, buy a new car. That must have been quite a car. It was, uh, it was an, an, a classic 911 Porsche, yeah. But you're not the kind of guy who wants the next new big thing. You're quite happy to, to hang on to a, a nice car. I like am that. a very frugal person. My friends know me that I, uh, I use the same thing to the max possible, with the exception of running shoes. I am um, big on buying brand new running shoes. I normally buy six pairs at a time, and I put 450 miles on my shoes, and my wife gives it away to Salvation Army. Uh, the shoes are very important. Shoes, knees, and the ground for, uh, to be able to run for a long time is really the key. Well, th- that really brings me to one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because I hear time and time again from doctors that you shouldn't be running these long distances, and especially as you get older, that the impact on your joints is going to be tremendous and that you're potentially doing yourself more harm than good. That's quite true. In, in the sense of evolution, uh, perhaps uh, we have not been designed to run because our knees are really... Uh, they're strong, but they, um, they cannot tolerate the impact. But in a sense, we have also abused our knees. Uh, you know, I'm 5'11", uh, uh, I weigh 149 pounds. I have weighed the same way for literally 45, 50 years. I weigh myself, that's a scale, that scale is mine in my office, as you see. I weigh myself twice a day to make sure that I titrate my weight like my checking account. <laughs> and uh, so the weight is the key. If you maintain your weight, uh, so your knees can tolerate that. The second is the ground that you run. Regrettably, a lot of people are forced to run on asphalt or concrete. And just based on the physics, uh, that asphalt or concrete doesn't give in. I've been very fortunate. I run on trails, dirt, uh, so the weight, uh, then the shoes, and the ground. And I've been, uh, I recently switched my shoes for the last four years. Uh, just uh, I buy these shoes that they have tremendous cushioning. 
And um, so a combination of your weight, your shoes, and the ground that you run. If these three combinations are the right, they have the right relationship, if you will, then you can run for a long time. I've been running for 52 years and uh, roughly 50 miles a week. If you add up the math, uh, that gives comes out to close to 135 or 34,000 miles. And, and I'm sure you can figure out that around the globe is only about 24,600 miles. Uh, that makes up close to five times. So what you're saying is there's quite a lot you can do to mitigate some of the potential problems of running sure. in terms of your weight and the kind of shoes that you're wearing, where you're running. And we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG. And we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. Correct. But at the same time, you know, you have to uh, you have to understand that there's one more hidden factor. I have had. Um, I always tease that people change their wives, their houses, their cars. I change my running partners because I have uh, had a number of in LA area as well that running partners that they have given up, they have had injuries, and they cannot run. So I, my running partners are now 20, 25 years younger than me. The hidden factor that I'm referring to is perhaps the genes. Some people are fortunate that uh, I have no knee pain, nothing, virtually. I, I, I don't take a single drug. I just uh, um, maybe one Motrin a year before the Catalina Marathon, although that this year I didn't take that either. So I have no knee pain at all. So genes perhaps play a role. Tell me to what extent do you think running has played, or clearly it's played a major role in your current state of health? Perhaps uh, running has played one factor, and by also my um, choice of lifestyle. I, um, I eat modest amount. People who know me for the last 40 years, every lunch, uh, I buy a bowl of vegetarian soup in our cafeteria here. It used to be 77 cents, and now it's $2.18. <laughs> I thought you might know the price. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I take my bowl of vegetarian soup to conference with our fellows. I mean, a number of factors have played in my, my longevity and the positive outlook. Um, contact with the fellows. I'm very fortunate. I deal with young people young students every day. I meet one of my fellow. Fellows are the people that we train here. Um, we train lung specialists. Uh, and I meet with them in the, in the morning at 7.30 in the morning. Then lunchtime, we have a conference. Just being around young people, young residents, uh, um, gives you a very, uh, keeps you young. Those are some of the factors. What's really fascinating to me is, and you've just encapsulated really in that last answer and some of the other things you've said in this interview, from doing now 100 episodes of this podcast, you've described a lifestyle that I think personifies an individual who is likely to achieve a great health span, and that is uh, optimize the years that you can remain vital and, and healthy, and that is a, a relatively frugal lifestyle, simple eating, not eating red meat, having a mostly vegetarian or plant-based diet, obviously in your case, lots of exercise, a zen-like approach, uh, a stable mind, uh, a happy mind, if you like, and someone who is, uh, as you say, associating a lot with, with younger people, which is something that comes up a lot. These are all different pillars, in my mind, of, of longevity, and it seems as if you do them all. I have had also one more. I, I, I have surrounded myself by a lot of young people, but I also have some very old people that are very, very close friends. My, um, my wine drinking partner now, he, he's 94, and uh, I have dinner with him once a month, 
and uh, he's fortunate that he has a very nice cellar, and I have a good taste in wine, so we share a bottle of wine. Um, and I write about that to him next day. I send him a note describing the evening. Uh, so I enjoy these little things in life. Uh, um, they are not fancy, uh, but they are really, um, it provides you a new outlook in life. You know, life is so precious, and you can really see tiny cracks in life. There's sort of a shining light through those cracks. Once you explore those small cracks, you can explore the world. And I'm not saying that I'm not selling any cultish ideas. It's just the simple things in life. Um, you notice that, Peter, some days you wake up, you are so happy. Some days you wake up, you are gloomy, and it's almost like the whole world is about to collapse. Those two days are no different. They're the same days. Nothing has changed. If you just you change, you a- adapt your mind, your thinking, think that the day that you felt good, you like to replicate that. You like to duplicate that. And if you feel like that, that you, you can have, you take control of your well-being in a sense. You can feel better by saying that today, the reason I feel bad, there's no reason to feel bad today. Yesterday was the same. I felt good. Why don't I go back to yesterday's feeling? And you really have to talk to your mind to do that. Running does that. It's almost like resets your mind. It's almost a computer that needs re- rebooting. Running does that to me, at least. That was my first thought when you mentioned that, that that process, that mind process, if you perhaps do wake up in the morning not feeling so good, but it's the time on your run that you can you can reconcile those issues in your mind, and, and that's how you enable yourself to, to come to work feeling on top of the world. Precisely, precisely. Once you force yourself to get out of the house and start running, after about a mile or two, you just say that, my God, you know, I don't know. I know I was feeling terrible or gloomy, but I, I feel fine now. And just for anyone listening who's just thinking, well, I just, I just couldn't do all of that running. Of course, it doesn't have to be running, does it? You could go for a, a two-mile walk at 5 a.m. Uh, just after you've woken up and, and achieve the same sort of thing. Absolutely. It's not just running. It's really, it's you. It's you that you develop a lifestyle, an approach to life. To, to think positively and to eat healthy, to help people, to view people healthy, to view your environment. And we are so blessed. Um, I'm not a religious person, but I'm always grateful that all these things in life that have been afforded to me. And I just wanted to ask you, just going back to something you said a moment ago with your friend who's in his 90s and you enjoy a bottle of wine, red wine or white wine, which do you prefer? Yeah, red wine. Red wine. Red so, wine. so what's that, half a bottle of red wine <clears> each? Uh, How was your run the next morning after that? Well, I mean, I, I don't drink every night. I, when we meet uh, on weekends or once a month, uh, after a good glass of good wine, uh, the running next day is no problem. Uh, I actually, um, I'm a big believer of that uh, everyone in life should have at least one glass of very good wine in their lifetime. Good wine. And there are so many theories about that, of course, and we see a study nearly every other day that, that alcohol is good for you, alcohol isn't so good for you. But And again, we hear, well, okay, in moderation, and it seems as if that's the, the policy that you follow. Yeah, I, I, the red wine, I, I drink red wine not because of alcohol or, or the uh, particular benefit of red wine, which is really, uh, you have to drink a lot of red wine to accumulate that kind of effect. Yeah. I, the red wine has a very complicated uh, bouquet and the flavor. Um, uh, to me, once you have a discerning palate, uh, you can have a sip of good wine, and uh, then you feel the rush of citrus, coffee, leather, uh, the dirt, and cider, uh, and uh, those uh, flavors of uh, bouquet of truffle rushes out. To be able to discern those kind of things, to me, is a wonderful challenge about the red wine. 
and uh, uh, I, I drink red wine really um, to be able to identify these different uh, flavors. I've never heard a glass of red wine so eloquently described. It makes me want to pour a glass right now. Well, maybe beautiful. there's an opportunity we can open a good bottle of red wine. That would be good. Um, let's talk for a moment about your career as a doctor. Where did you go to school? What made you want to be a, a so doctor? My father, um, my father was um, an old uh, Russian man who uh, smoked three packs a day more than some days more and he lived to be 88 89 as a matter of fact um, he um, he he my mother passed away at mid 80s and my father remarried to a very young woman and at age 87 86 uh, he was still very vigorous i was always puzzled i always knew that smoking was bad for you but i was puzzled that uh, why despite the fact that he smoked, he was a heavy smoker, he lived such a young, healthy life. I was fascinated uh, by just the science of this resistance, and we now know that uh, there are resistant genes to smoking, and we know that not every smoking uh, smoker uh, gets uh, COPD or emphysema, about 20% of them get so that's why I chose uh, the pulmonary field, uh, the lung mechanics. I wanted to understand. Uh, so 40-some years ago, I um, decided to go in the lung field. Um, and I have studied, uh, um, ironically, the, those fundamentals of uh, emphysema and COPD and the physiology of uh, uh, smoking uh, has been my line of research for the last 40 years. Uh, uh, I have always been fascinated at how come uh, not every smoker develops emphysema. And indeed, uh, we know that some people happen to have a certain amount of resistance. Uh, and it's been, uh, it's been an incredible ride. I have enjoyed every day of my life work at Cedars. You know, Peter, after my run, I rush to get to work. I leave home at about 6 uh, 30. And I'm trying to be in my office at 7 a.m. every morning. And, but at the same time, at the end of the day, I rush to get home because I enjoy my home environment. I have been able to balance my work and uh, my running, my home life. Uh, 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 I have two daughters. I, I adore my kids. And uh, um, they are not regrettably none of them became runners although that uh, <laughs> they were very kind recently uh, for my 70th birthday they organized a 70 mile hike and run around the uh, around uh, Mont Blanc uh, we just did it last week um, they did the hiking I did the running around Mont Blanc uh, crossing um, France Switzerland Italy and uh, but they were good sport they did the 70 mile hike with me and uh, I'm very grateful to that. You mentioned you rush home from work. I, I just get the sense that you're always just keen to do the next thing. What time does your working day generally finish? Some days uh, uh, could be, you know, could have late uh, meetings. Uh, uh, the traffic pattern in LA is that you have to beat the traffic oh, pattern. Yes. I try not to uh, leave um, uh, between uh, five and six. Five and six. Uh, uh, you don't want to be on the Santa Monica Freeway uh, and Pacific Coast mm -hmm. Highway. And uh, I try to be either before that or after that. My morning traffic is actually wonderful because I leave so early that uh, I'm at work. But the traffic has gotten worse. Uh, the last 40 years, because uh, I've lived in the same house for 40 years, and the traffic has gotten really bad. I can tell you're very proud of living in that same house for, for so long. But what, the point really I'm getting at is you work a long day, and longer than most people. And on top of that, not only I work long day, uh, I answer my emails uh, um, uh, for about 18 hours a day. Um, I was in uh, um, Switzerland just last week, and uh, one of our physicians uh, just two in the morning, Swiss time, he sent me an email about a report of a, uh, a patient, uh, lung function that he wanted to know uh, he should or he should not stop certain medications. And uh, 2 a.m. Swiss time, I logged on to uh, Cedar's uh, 
computer system. I looked at this patient's data, and uh, I provided them a report, and I made recommendations in terms of adjusting medication. So I, I, um, I make myself available to a physician group at Cedars um, uh, day in, day out. So my, I may go home, but my work doesn't end. Even though that I, I might watch a movie, I'm on my email, answering my emails uh, throughout. And what time do you go to bed? I go to bed at 10.15, and I wake up at 4.45 every day, and uh, like a clock. Hmm. And that's enough sleep for you? Uh, it's not enough sleep, but I, uh, um, I try to take a nap Saturday and Sunday afternoon for an hour. <laughs> so Because uh, sleep is like a checkbook. Uh, you accumulate deficit. So you have to pay back at some point. I just want to go back to something you said about smoking. You've spent many, many years working on and trying to understand the effects of smoking and the fact that some people appear to be to have some resistance to smoking, to the effects of smoking. I'm curious to know maybe people listening to this who are smokers, is that giving them an excuse to continue with it? No, my plea with them is that stop smoking before it's late. Smoking, Peter, has been one of the uh, disasters of our um, industrial world. Uh, smoking, as much as I understand the smokers, because I am addicted to running and I, I have a lot of empathy for people who are addicted to, uh, my addiction happens to be a positive addiction. And so I understand. I understand and my father smoked, so I know how difficult it is to stop but there are ways just a little aside a doctor once said to me that trying to persuade a lifelong smoker to give up smoking at a great age is is similar to trying to persuade a lifelong exerciser an extreme exerciser to give up maybe for functional reasons that they need to maybe just ease back trying to tell someone like that with that kind of mindset is is extremely difficult and they're likely to ignore the advice no i mean that's quite true in a sense uh, that's what i'm saying that uh, if uh, anyone forces me to uh, uh, um, not to run i don't think that's gonna that's in the cards so uh, i truly understand smoker's dilemma but at the same time i understand the harm that smoking does to the body you know i do bronchoscopy and uh, which means that you know you put a tube you go through uh, people's lungs you go fresh lung looks very fresh nice coloring pinkish and you go inside the lungs of a smoker looks tar blackened smoking and cigarettes ravages lungs does so much damage to the lung it's really uh, my plea with every smoker is that uh, you can stop I have this uh, very weird tradition I always uh, when I see a smoking person I say that if you stop smoking at the anniversary of your smoking um, I will take you and your SO uh, significant other for a nice dinner any place any time and I have offered this this has been on the table for the last 40 years and you know only one couple have cashed in we had the head of HR at Cedars uh, Marilyn Sharp whose boyfriend smoked and uh, she forced him to stop smoking and on the anniversary of their uh, smoking cessation i took them out to a nice dinner That's good. and and that offer goes to anyone anyone that i know uh, uh smoking is really seriously bad notwithstanding the fact that some people may have resistance notwithstanding the fact that ev- not every smoker will get lung disease but you know 20 25 percent chance of uh if i know that there's a 25 percent chance something's going to happen to me on the way home. I won't leave Cedars tonight. Hmm. Yeah. So 20, 25% chance is a very, very high risk. Exactly. And uh, at the science is pretty definitive. We can debate global warming and we can debate climate change, but there really isn't any debate about the effect of smoking. No, is smoking has been settled. I think smoking, uh, even tobacco companies, in a very um, uh, ironic way, tobacco companies are investing on uh, promoting uh, those mechanisms that creates resistance to smoking. 
They understand. As well as smoking, you've spent a, a major part of your career on AIDS. And I know you were writing about AIDS before it was actually given a name. Sure. I mean, I, I've been here for 40 years, and uh, uh, we, uh, we had um, one of the first patients that uh, – one of the four patients that Michael Gottlieb published, actually, uh, was a patient at Cedars, uh, uh, belonged to the, actually one of our physicians – and um, I was a big advocate of uh, um, AIDS unit at Cedars. Uh, it was a very, that was a very tragic time. Uh, it was really, um, I have difficulty actually talking about that, uh, uh, that period because, uh, you know, we, it was really tough time. Uh, I would leave Friday and if I wasn't on call, I would come back uh, Monday and a number of people were gone. It was really, um, it was heart-wrenching, period. Uh, it's actually, uh, that's the only, one of the few topics that uh, when I talk about it, I get choked. It's really, uh, we lost so many co-workers. I lost people that I worked with. It was a very, very sad time. And the Cedars, uh, um, uh, we rose up. Uh, I was really proud that we rose up to the occasion, despite the fact that there were some people who were against the establishing uh, uh, an AIDS unit at Cedars, but the institution rose to the occasion. We had a very active AIDS unit, and we really helped out the community quite a bit. That was a very dark period uh, in, our, um, in my medical career. It was... Um, it was, um, and, and unfortunately, uh, I mean, fortunately that the science really was able to uh, forge ahead and, uh, 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 and come up with a lot of uh, anti-HIV uh, uh, medications. But my uh, concern is that some of the young, um, young people, they have forgotten the ravages that AIDS did and uh, they uh, are um, entering uh, careless behaviors now. To me, that's one of the concerns that developing uh, now amongst the uh, community. I am less involved with that now, but it's something that I observe that people need to be aware and the community leaders need to advocate uh, uh, safe sex and uh, healthy uh, uh, lifestyle. Because I think there is a sense, uh, and probably mostly amongst young people, that uh, AIDS has been cured, that it's a, a disease of the past, because we now know how to at least mitigate the disease to some extent. But it, it isn't cured, is it? No, I mean, AIDS, basically what it is, it's like uh, um, you have uh, um, a guerrilla fight. Uh, they are, you're suppressing them by you're not eliminating them. And they're sort of waiting in the wings. They're looking for the opportunity of the weak immunity to rise up and uh, come after you. Let's look to the future. And uh, I, I get a sense that you're the kind of guy that, that does that. You're always keen to come to work. You're keen to go home and to, to do the next thing. You're planning your 101st marathon. Sure. I'm going to be running. A, I'm going to continue running. And I'm pretty, I'm, I'm in great shape. Uh, um, obviously, um, one of the uh, challenges uh, with um, I'm a very obsessive, uh, compulsive person. I have uh, put my time over years, uh, my marathon time, and year to year there's minimal difference. But when you look at the 10, 20, 30 years, uh, you understand what aging does to you. I have, yeah, so what's your, what's your best marathon time? Um, I used to run close to three-hour marathons. Now I do four hours and a change. And, but I'm going to continue running. So I don't necessarily run for time. I run for my uh, overall well-being, mental, physical, and just... Uh, uh, so I'm going to continue running. Uh, I will continue... Um, uh, I run a race in Death Valley, uh, I, and I'm going to continue to run the Catalina Marathon. And you mentioned running in Death Valley very, very casually. That is no mean feat. I mean, it's called Death Valley for a reason. It is true. I, I actually, I'm embarrassed to talk about it because it's really insane. Uh, as a matter of fact, we are going uh, August 7th uh, uh, 
and, and I'm anticipating my my partners are coming flying from Germany and Hawaii to run and um, uh, but that's um, actually Death Valley is not bad. Uh, four in the morning, um, uh, it's uh, ninety-five or hundred degrees, but it's very dry. It's a very dry, nice breeze, and it's very flat, and it's a wonderful environment. Uh, and there's a wonderful hot spring there. That we create. This is my vacations are very Spartan. We take two uh, suburbans, put a tarp between the two suburbans, create a little shade and get into this um, hot spring, which is 105 degrees, but feels lukewarm, and uh, play chess all day. But you say it's in the 90s when you're running a marathon in Death Valley, early in the morning. There are big city marathons that are cancelled when temperatures get to that level because they're concerned about the, the heat and the run. But they have to do that. They have to do that. In the city, you, you're looking at the population uh, the, the ma- marathons that I do sometimes are called uh, chicken races. Uh, that they're, they're really organized by small groups. Uh, we have more. Uh, we we don't run races to make big names, and uh, these are small organized uh, runs that we organize in just our groups, so we can take risks. Big cities. Uh, that's a different story. You have to be, you know, city authorities. They have to be accountable for. Uh, uh, um, so just to get back in terms of the future, I'm going to continue running, and um, probably retire in about three or four years' time um, from um, Cedars. Maybe do something part time, uh, but then I have I have a plan. I grow orchids on the side. And my plan is to. Um, open an orchid store uh, because I raise orchids and I breed them for hobby and that's my plan for the future not for business uh, purpose just for something to do something productive what is the special skill in, in growing orchids well growing orchids you have to uh, be patient and uh, have uh, find uh, redwood bark and uh, and then you have to enjoy uh, requires a certain amount of um, obsessive compulsive disorder uh, to raise orchids because they are very they're very finicky since they don't have roots they have uh, ribosomes and they absorb uh, moisture from the contact between uh, redwood bark and the ribosome and uh, as a matter of fact I just I had um, I had a new breed that I had developed that I just uh, shared it with my um, drinking partner. Um, that I took it to him a couple of nights ago, um, this breed, uh, uh, for him to enjoy it. And how many orchids do you have? Do you do this at home? Yes. I, uh, one of my patients about 37 years ago, um, I had no clue about orchids. I had never – actually, I was not familiar with the orchids at all. I had a – wonderful patient about 37 years ago at Cedars. Um, I sort of saved his life and um, I used to do these procedures, YAG, laser vaporization, and he introduced me to orchids and and that's how I started. Uh, um, And then I propagated, I have a couple hundred orchids, I have a small orchid greenhouse in my home and uh, when I go home after work, uh, I spend about half an hour, an hour with them just to make sure that um, they are well taken care of. I was actually curious as to when you managed to fit this into your, your busy daily life. It's, uh, my days are packed. Believe me, uh, the, the, my weekends, uh, I, when I go running in the morning, uh, my weekends, uh, I don't stop till about 4 or 5 in the afternoon. Uh, I go on continuously until I take a nap. And your family is okay with this? I mean, they probably love you for the way that you are. My family, uh, uh, been married for a long time. And uh, when I uh, met my wife, I, I told her that uh, I met her in a patient's room, actually at UCLA. I, I told her that um, my running and my work is really not on the table to compete with. And she's 
been perfectly accommodated to me and uh, and my kids as well. But at the same time, I have I have been cooperative. I remember I ran a fifty mile race um, from uh, Paramount Ranch to uh, Pepperdine and back a few years ago. My kids were younger. I ran this fifty mile race over seven and a half eight hours. Then I came home. I had lost 12, 13 pounds, actually, that particular day. But I took my kids to the birthday party that I was supposed to be taking them. And I was a good sport. I, uh, I got home, and I uh, took the kids for the party. So I deliver. You deliver. That's good. You've mentioned a few times during this interview that you are obsessive, that you are compulsive about, it seems, just about everything in your life. And I guess you have lots of spreadsheets on your computer of all your running times and you're very meticulous in terms of keeping records what I'm really interested in is the fact that you describe yourself in that way a lot of people will use that as a negative that they're compulsive they're obsessive about life so everything is relative there's um, just the way that we eat there's a healthy amount of eating there's a healthy amount of uh, there's an unhealthy amount of not eating, and there's an unhealthy degree of overeating. I think accountability and accepting responsibility is uh, is something that I expect from myself and everyone around me. If I tell you that you were supposed to be here at eight o'clock, if you didn't show up at eight, you showed up at nine. I would be disturbed. And uh, to me, that's uh, expectation. Uh, when I leave my house, I make sure that I close the garage door. I don't rush out of the driveway without paying attention to the garage door's closing. To me, that's a healthy amount of paying attention to details. But if I drive away, knowing that I close the garage door and I turn around to see if the garage door is closed, then that becomes a degree of unhealthy OCD. And I think when people who view uh, negativism on the OCD disorders, that's what they're talking about. So I, uh, I do pay attention to details. I have a lot of spreadsheet of uh, um, you know everything, and I've been blessed by a good memory. But I don't consider myself uh, um, to the degree that it's abnormal degree of OCD. I try to be on time. I arrive. I, my wife always teases me that when, if you invite us for dinner at 7 o'clock, I am there at 7. I'm not there before 7. I'm not there after 7. And... Uh, so you don't um, go along with this being fashionably late thing that we uh, get in Los Angeles all the time. I am. Um, I expect people uh, like uh, my fellow that I meet here, and every month there's a different fellow. They're supposed to be at seven thirty, not seven thirty one, <laughs> not seven twenty nine, seven thirty. And I I make a point teaching them something about punctuality, and I have tried to do that with my. Uh, my uh, children as well, mm. and that it's really important to be on time, to be dependable, uh, because these are the small things that teaches, you know, routine, and uh, so you don't have to worry about big ticket items. Do you get to airports early? I do get to the airport early. I have never missed a uh, flight. My wife has missed flights. Uh, uh, I have never missed any deadline. I have never paid my taxes late. I have never, I have never received uh, a, a driving violations. And uh, I try to follow basic rules. Uh, um, I, I'm more comfortable being in the middle of the lane as opposed to the left lane. And you must, therefore, and I don't really want to delve into politics or anything like that, but you must get frustrated by what, a lot of what you see happening around you, the way that people live these days, perhaps the way that public figures operate, that there is a, a sort of laissez-faire attitude sometimes about life and that people, you talk about the the rules that you follow for your own daily mm -hmm. life that, that seem to go out of the window for a lot of people these days. So I, you know, I deal with one of my jobs at Cedars is that uh, 
you know, the physicians, just like um, any other, you know, healthcare workers, sometimes they misbehave. And in my position, one of my jobs is really to counsel them. And there's no major punishment here. We just chat for an hour. What I'm trying to say that um, all the divisiveness that you see, um, if people just talk, people have capacity to talk and listen. And the way I deal with these physicians, I listen to them, their issues. Because a good example would be that two in the morning a nurse might be calling a physician and the physician yells at the nurse. And I try to listen to both sides. And once you listen to people, gradually they solve the problem themselves. And I think the issue in our society right now that the people have stopped talking. They talk over each other, not to each other. And uh, people need to communicate. If you communicate with someone for an hour and to hear them out, when you listen to people, Peter, that's half of the problem. If, when, when someone feels that you heard them, you listen to them and you heard them. The, the problem, I suppose, being you're saying not listening and, and not acknowledging what so another person is saying. you have to listen first and you have to hear them. Two separate things. And uh, by hearing, they're acknowledging in a sense. So once you do that, that's like 50%. You have given them 50% already. Then they admit that, okay, maybe I should have done it differently. Maybe I should have said this differently. Maybe I should have uh, uh, behaved differently. Because most of us are in a position that we can really tell wrong from right. Right from wrong. I believe majority of human beings, we just have the same genome. We have capacity. Most of us, our genome are very, very similar. So I, I cannot scientifically believe that we cannot really understand our uh, bad deeds. We can. And do you think this uh, deterioration in the way in which we communicate seemingly can't listen to each other properly has anything to do with technology and the technology that we we actually use these days to communicate and everything is brief it's, everything is a few words short messages that really don't amount to conversations i i think that that may play a role but i i believe there's still you know in the last thousands of years that the man has lived Technology provided a lot of positives, and uh, technology also has taken away some uh, some of those uh, emotional bonds. But I still believe that uh, you could have good relationship, you could have good communications, even in the presence of uh, some of the fast-paced uh, communications or Snapchat, those things. Uh, uh, I spend a lot of time on uh, various, uh, uh, I think, to me, technology has offered tremendous, to me personally, um, I have the capacity now to read five newspapers by the time that I come to work, between my running and showers, uh, uh, I have read uh, uh, Xinhao, the Chinese newspaper, or uh, or uh, the New York Times, Washington Post, and uh, so I have, I have kept up. So it's uh, technology offers that. In the old days, I didn't have that. If I wanted to really, at most, whatever paper that was delivered to my uh, door, that was the only option, or the news uh, from the radio. But right now, I have a lot of access. To me, that's very positive. And I can see that. I mean, you're sitting on at your desk now. You've got your huge computer screen there. You've got your tablet in front of you. You use technology, clearly. No, I'm, as I've been talking to you, yeah. believe me, periodically I've been answering my emails. And, uh, <laughs> I can tell. I, yeah. <laughs> well, I can see. You, you, you certainly couldn't tell from the nature of the right. conversation we were having. But uh, we're, we're all multi-skilled in this respect. Sure. And, and it's a skill that we've all acquired. And I'm pressing sure. buttons here just to get things right. And it's. I think it's progress. I actually... Enjoy it and, I, and relish the. I view to do this. this all positively. I mean, when I go to a restaurant, 
Um, now I can log on, make my reservation. I know exactly what I'm going to order. I look at the menu online. Uh, I don't waste time there. I, I can. So these are all the positive features. Uh, uh, um, my kids are away, but I feel that I can be in touch with them any moment. I know uh, which hotels my daughter is in Switzerland right now. It's, uh, these are all positive. I, I, I feel technology has offered a new dimension at some expense, no doubt, at some expense. And uh, there have been some loss of privacy. I understand that. But I think that's a small, um, uh, at least personally, I feel that um, I am willing to uh, give up some um, privacy in return, gain so much uh, opportunity. Now, as we look ahead, and I mentioned this is the 100th episode of this podcast, and a question I often ask people is looking to the future, or, or indeed perhaps looking over your life in terms of your attitude towards your own longevity, essentially how long you're going to live and perhaps the kind of life that you'll be living in your final few years. Is that something that you have thought about or do you think about now? Very much so. Very much so. I think about it. I, I always I tell my uh, running friends that I have um, 18 uh, good summers left. And uh, uh, why, why 18? Uh, I don't want to say 20. I don't want to jinx uh, to be <laughs> 90. It's very possible that, uh, you know, I have uh, my heart rate is uh, 48. And my blood pressure is 120 over 65. Uh, I weigh 149 pounds. I run cholesterols of 160. Perfection. So I am um, my coronary CTs. Uh, I have zero calcification, and uh, unless I get hit by a car or something during the run, uh, I don't like to get on the bike. And I advise very much against uh, uh, biking on the city streets. Uh, so, but just. Uh, Realistically, I think I feel that when I say 18 good summers, uh, I think at least for the next 10 years, I should be able to run marathons. And uh, after that, probably depending on how things go. But I, um, you can imagine that I have a large number of patients at various ages so I am fully aware of um, the realistic decline in uh, certain functions uh, as you age. Um, I have some very, very robust 85-year-old uh, patients and friends. I have less of that number in 90-year-olds and even less at 95. So... Um, if you average it out, 85 to till about 85, you can maintain a lot of the good functions. 85 to 90, uh, you start having uh, significant decrements. After 90, um, then the functions have to be really readjusted um, because of the. Um, just the way our design is that your hearing gets worse, you have to get a lot of things have to be retuned. So I think uh, uh, I can only speak for myself that I feel that as long as I run, to me that's uh, very, very positive. As long as I could taste uh, good uh, red wine, I can uh, discern the tastes. Uh, so I think... Uh, 90, those are, I, I stand by my 18 good summers. Well, it all sounds like a, a great recipe for uh, what I often talk about, this healthy health span, this yeah. lifetime of doing stuff. And you personify the idea of yeah. someone who fills their day with activity, purposeful living, and happiness as well. That's right. And also, I think one also, one should not be fearing death. I think death should be considered uh, a, a chapter. Uh, you know, life is a chapter. It's over. I don't necessarily believe life after death. You know, my, uh, my ashes will be uh, the, the splattered over the trails that I run. My, my running partners know that. 
and uh, but that's perfectly fine. It's uh, to me uh, as long as people have a good memory of me. To me, that's a continuation of living from my perspective. It sounds perfect to me, Doctor Zab Mazanifar. Thank you very much for talking to us. My it's pleasure, been a, Peter. A really inspiring conversation. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for being our hundredth guest. And. Uh, if you would like to go to our website, you can check the index there, listen to some of our other interviews, maybe Dr. Volta Longo talk about his fasting and his fasting mimicking diet, or Dr. Sachin Panda, with whom we discuss his really exciting work on the circadian rhythm and time-restricted eating. They are some of our most popular episodes. They're in the archive at lamapodcast.com. That's double L-A-M-A podcast. Dot com, or you can listen to us at Apple Podcasts or your podcast streaming platform of choice. Wherever you find us, thanks very much. And here's to the next 100. Health optimization is what this podcast is all about. And that means taking care of our mitochondria, the energy centres of our cells. Physical strength, avoiding frailty, is key. And that's why the science behind urolithin A and the work of Timeline Nutrition is so interesting. You can find out more and get a discount code at our website and in the show notes for this episode.